in cardiac surgery, time is precious and errors are costly. So how do you gain the most amount of clinical information in the shortest period of time when performing your TEE exam? Well, in this episode of Tea Time, I'm going to share with you step by step the most efficient way to do so. Welcome to episode five of Tea Time. I'm your host, Dr. Andreas Plakis, and today we're talking about the most efficient TEE exam. The clinical question we're talking about today is how do you perform a TEE exam to obtain the most important clinical information in the shortest period of time in a cardiac surgery operating room? Up until now, we've talked about the indications for TEE, the contraindications. Last episode was all about probe placement and troubleshooting. Now that the probe is in place, we're going to discuss what is the best way to do a TEE exam. So there's a few different goals that we're trying to obtain when we perform a TEE exam. Ultimately, we want to learn the greatest amount of cardiac information about our patient. Other things we want are to do it in a time-sensitive manner, as frequently surgeons are waiting on us to make their surgical decisions based on our findings. We want to be accurate and not miss certain things. We also want to have a very clear system that can be repeatable, efficient, clear, and easy to remember. I want us to remember a few important points about this. We're creating a routine sequence that we can perform systematically nearly every exam. Some of the best healthcare providers out there are the most thorough, but also very efficient. And that's because they're systematic. They don't miss little things, but they have a clear sequence of events so they can go through them quickly. This system can be deviated from when you have hemodynamic instability or a clinical question that you really need to answer when you're discussing with another team member. Also, just remember, this is a big picture idea. It doesn't apply to rescue echo where there's a different sequence of events or unique circumstances. It also doesn't touch on every detail of the exam, just the sequence I want us to remember and go through. The sequence we're going to go through is an acronym called LRSAS. It stands for look, rotate, slide, ascend, and then scan. And more specifically, each letter of this acronym corresponds to a different part of the heart that we're looking at. And I wanna give a quick shout out to Dr. Christina Jelly, a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, who was the first person who taught me a framework for this. You're basically looking at the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart, going into the stomach, turning towards the aorta and going back, and then looking at any other special parts of the heart, such as the interatrial septum, pulmonary veins, left atrial appendage. So let's go through these one by one, and I'll just show you specifically what I'm talking about. We'll start by looking at the left-sided heart structures. These were chosen first because they are the most clinically relevant structures in the vast majority of cases. They're also the ones surgeons are going to come walking in the room and say, how's the LV function? How's the aortic valve? So that's why these are first on the list. We're going to look at the left-sided heart structures first. When we look at the left ventricle, there's three views we're going to look at every time. The metasophageal four chamber, the metasophageal two chamber, and the metasophageal long axis view where we're looking for LV ejection fraction, any wall motion abnormalities, baseline effusions. We're also taking a look at the left atrium for its size and any observable abnormalities. Next, we'll look at the aortic valve. I find that this influences clinical decision-making more so than any other valve in regards to cannulation strategies, mechanical support eligibility, or even cardioplegia administration strategies. I look at the aortic valve in at least two views every time with the metasophageal aortic valve short axis with and without color and the metasophageal aortic valve long axis with and without color looking for any aortic regurgitation or aortic stenosis and the location, mechanism, and severity of those. I'll also at this time in the long axis get my LVOT and aortic valve annulus measurements and since I'm there, I'll also measure the ascending aorta at that time. If you need to, do 3D of the aortic valve at this time as well. Next, what I look at is the mitral valve. I do this a little bit differently than some people, and I find it's more efficient the way I'm going to share with you. Instead of looking at a four-chamber, a two-chamber, a metasophageal commissural view, a long axis, four different views, I can obtain the same amount of information by looking at a metasophageal commissural view with and without color and explaining through that commissural view to get my long axis view. I look at my A2 and P2 area, then slide laterally to my A1-P1, 
then slide medially to my A3, P3. I can get gradients from this view and measure vena contracta from my long axis views, and I'll look for any associated mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis in the Carpentier class. After the left-sided structures, we're going to rotate to evaluate the right heart. When assessing the right ventricle, I do this in two views. One is the metasophageal four-chamber view, and the other is the metasophageal RV inflow-outflow view. When assessing the right ventricle, you can do this with the eyeball test. You can measure a TAPSI, do a fractional area of change, or even more advanced maneuvers like 3D, right ventricular ejection fraction, or strain. I also take note of the right atrium and any abnormalities located within the right atrium. Also, while I'm looking at the right side, I look at the tricuspid valve. I make sure to measure this in three different views, the four-chamber view, the RV inflow-outflow view, and then the modified bicaval view. And while I'm in the modified bicaval view, if I don't have a pulmonary artery catheter in place, that's when I'll measure my RVSP to be able to have a better understanding of what the patient's PA pressures are. And here we'll look for any tricuspid regurgitation or tricuspid stenosis. If we need to further evaluate with gradients or even hepatic vein flow, I'll do the gradients at that time, but I'll save the hepatic vein flow till the end as it doesn't flow naturally or efficiently with my exam at that point. The last thing I do when I'm looking at right-sided structures is I'll look at the pulmonic valve. I'll do this with a quick look at the RV inflow outflow view. And then I'll also do an upper esophageal aortic arch short axis. And I put this here not because I perform this here, but just to note we're taking a look with two different views of the pulmonic valve. And I'll do this during the A, aortic part of my exam since it's more naturally flows at that point. Again, this can be difficult to image at certain points, but it's an important part of the exam. All right, we've looked at the left side of structures. We've looked at the right side of structures. Now we're gonna advance and slide the probe into the stomach for our stomach views. While we're obtaining transgastric views, I look in three different views. My transgastric basal short axis, my mid-papillary short axis, and my apical short axis to look for any wall motion abnormalities to further delineate left ventricular function and then see if there's any baseline effusions. I'll also at this time advance further and get a deep transgastric LVOT pulse wave Doppler and aortic valve continuous wave Doppler to complete my exam in the stomach. Now, after I've completed my exam in the stomach, I'll rotate leftward and start to ascend with the probe by pulling it back while looking at the aorta. So this is where you look at several different parts of the aorta. You look at the descending aorta, and I do this with X-plane. I find it only gives me more information and a different view of the aorta than I would otherwise have. But I'll pull back looking at the descending aorta, go up to the aortic arch and look at that in both the long axis and the short axis, evaluating continuously for any plaques, any dissections, any aneurysms. And then as I come back around and push in a little bit, I'll see the metasophageal ascending aorta short axis at that time. So we finished the left side of structures, the right side of structures, the stomach views, the aortic views. Then there's a few findings I saved till the end, but they can all be obtained by just rotating your probe back and forth since they're all within the same depth axis. Now these include the interatrial septum, which I'll do at zero degrees, I'll do at 45 degrees and at 90 degrees. Make sure you turn your color scale down to between 30 and 40 so you don't miss low flow shunts through it. I'll also do my right upper pulmonary vein and left upper pulmonary vein evaluation. Once you're in the mid-esophageal bicaval view looking at the interatrial septum, all I do is turn a little bit more right, and there's the right upper pulmonary vein in my field of view, and then turn back leftward to look at the left upper pulmonary vein. Now, if there's not significant mitral regurgitation, if I don't have any major clinical concerns, I'll just get these two veins. But if I do have clinical concerns, such as in a lung transplant, patient where I need to get a good baseline or I need to evaluate these or I need to further delineate uh, mitral regurgitation, I'll get the lower veins at this point as well. Also, while I'm turned left to look at the left upper pulmonary vein, I turn back right just slightly and there's your left atrial appendage that comes into your field of view. And I'll look at this in X plane in both zero degree and 45 degree and that gives you four different views to make sure you're not seeing any appendage thrombus. And then I'll also put color or a pulse wave Doppler in it to check my velocities and further reassure me that there's no clot in the left atrial appendage. At this time, if I need to look at more, I'll look at the hepatic IVC flow, look for TR severity and quantify that way. I'll do more advanced calculations and more 3D imaging if needed. And I save this for last, but diastology. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more as I find it to be the least clinically useful assessment of a comprehensive exam.
When I was first learning TEE, I found this picture to be very, very helpful in assessing how I both advance, withdraw, or rotate my probe to be able to get views and have a very efficient exam. So I'll try to demonstrate by looking at this, your mid-esophageal four chamber is the home base for the entire exam. When I'm looking at my left-sided structures, all I'm doing is changing my omniplane throughout the whole exam going back to my four chamber view at zero degree. When I look at my right side of structures, I'm rotated slightly right, but just changing my omniplane again. And then as I go into the stomach, I'll get my different stomach views at that point. I'll rotate left. And then as I withdraw the probe, I'll come up the aorta and turn back rightward to get the other parts of the aorta, such as the arch and the ascending aorta. And then I'll advance the probe back to home base where I'll get the special findings, such as the septum, the pulmonary veins, the left atrial appendage. And you can see you finish back at your home base at the mid-esophageal four-chamber view. I mentioned I wanted to touch further on diastology and that I put it last in my exam because I find it to be the least clinically useful. I have yet to hear someone say this out loud. I am really glad that I looked at diastology because it sure made a difference helping with patient care today. Maybe people will try to keep their filling pressures a little bit higher in avoiding hypovolemic states. Maybe they'll try to keep a heart rate a little bit faster, but I don't find it making a major clinical difference that all my other findings wouldn't point me to. So I welcome any arguments about this. Put something in the comments if you disagree with me, but that's my claim. I have yet to have it be very, very clinically useful in patient care. One more thing I'm going to touch on is color compare. Some people trying to go quickly with this love color compare, but there's two quick notes about this. If you want a very fast exam, it is a nice tool to have. Sometimes it goes twice as fast because you don't have to do images with and without color and acquire those. However, if you're trying to be very thorough and not miss things with just your 2D imaging, your frequency and frame rate is lower on your 2D image if you're also doing color compare. So you will get a lower resolution image. So it's a trade-off balance between speed and a more detailed image. So take that for what it's worth. I want to review the main points of this episode today. If you don't remember anything else, have a system. You can take this one that I'm sharing with you and adopt it to be your own, but have a system that you can do every single time so you don't forget things. You're systematic, you're thorough, you're efficient. My system, the LRSAS, left, right, stomach, aorta, special, I find to be very helpful for me. Go from the most to the least clinically relevant findings. Focus on the most important areas first before the surgeon starts bovying and you're not able to see certain images with color as well so you can make clinical decisions quicker. It's important to be quick with this, but don't hurry, says the great John Wooden. Move efficiently, but it's important your job is to be accurate in your exam. So don't hurry so much that you're missing things and making bad clinical decisions. And then with this system, only deviate when necessary, but know when that is when a patient's unstable if there's unique clinical scenarios. I'm excited to say that now that we've talked about indications, contraindications, how to insert the probe, how to do an exam, we're going to get into the meat of what this podcast is all about, how to perform TEE in different surgical cases. So the first one we're going to start basic is with coronary artery bypass surgery. That's the next episode, episode six. Tune in next time if you guys want to hear it. Thank you guys for joining in today. If you want more of this content, hit the subscribe button, write a review, leave a comment. It really does help us reach more people when you engage with us like that. But thank you again for joining. We'll see you guys next time. 